Welcome to the Jersey Pulse, your guide to South Jersey and the rest of the Garden State. I'm CBS News Philadelphia South Jersey reporter Brandon Goldner, and each week we bring you stories that are at the heart of your community. Let's get to this week's stories. A gun store in South Jersey is targeted. A group of thieves made off with handfuls of guns and ammunition, and it's all caught on surveillance video. Now, the store has only been open just a few months or so, and police are working to determine if the suspects are behind other burglaries. New Jersey reporter Ryan News is in Marlton with the very latest on the investigation. Security cameras were rolling when Evesham police say four burglars dressed in black with their faces covered smashed a glass door at Urban Tactical Firearms in Marlton before they stole five guns and ammunition. At first they attempted to use a hammer to break the glass. That was ineffective. They then um, used a landscaping rock that was brought with them. Um, uh, to commit the burglary. Police say the burglars then smashed the glass counters and they were in and out in less than two minutes. The burglary happened Monday around 2.30 in the morning at the store on Route 70 East. Police believe the suspects were dropped off and picked up in this white Hyundai. We believe that that vehicle was possibly stolen based on the fact that the uh, suspects exited the vehicle through the windows without opening the doors. It's scary. It's especially uh, the area that we're in. Hitanshu Patel owns a smoke shop two doors down. He says his store was hit four months ago after two people hurled a cement block through his door. Right now, police do not believe those two incidents are connected, but Patel is still concerned and now increasing security. Especially after that incident, we have we have to take some precautions for sure. Isham police calls this latest burglary disturbing and hopes someone that sees this video can help his officers make a quick arrest. We'd like to identify this group and recover those firearms before they're used to hurt or injure an innocent person. Isham police say there have been similar incidents in Pennsylvania that are possibly related. They are looking into that, and right now patrols have been increased around the store on Route 70. In Marlton, Ryan Hughes, CBS News, Philadelphia. Some drivers say it is intimidating to drive up over, while others refuse to cross the Washington Crossing Bridge altogether. But now there's talk the historic bridge may be replaced. Well, the bridge is just north of Trenton, New Jersey, crossing over the Delaware River, and New Jersey reporter Ryan Hughes has reaction from drivers out there and a possible timeline for a new bridge. It's nearly 120 years old and a tight squeeze, to say the least, in order to cross it. Narrow. <laughs> Very narrow. Very small and there's people that don't know how to drive across it. The Washington Crossing Bridge stretches over the Delaware River, connecting the historic parks in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. But the bridge is also the scene of many minor crashes with only inches to spare between cars. The single lane in each direction is seven and a half feet wide. It's 12 feet on a typical interstate highway. I'm clenching as I'm driving over like that's going to help. I've had kids that work here in the summertime that are 18, just got their license, and they come in and they're like, my mirror got hit. Was not designed for modern vehicles, certainly not designed for an SUV. Joe Resta is the executive director of the Delaware River Joint Toll Bridge Commission, which owns and operates the bridge. Resta says about 7,200 cars passed over it each day last year. With the traffic volume, functionality, and deterioration, the commission posted a request for proposal in January to begin the process of a possible bridge replacement. A lot of the work that has to be done hasn't even commenced yet. An environmental study and assessment will need to be done, but still early in the process, drivers have mixed feelings about building a new bridge. And I think that it should be bigger because so many people use it. It's not bad, but I'm not looking forward to a new bridge if they tear down this bridge first. The commission says it hopes to award a contract to a consulting team sometime in June, but we're told there are many hoops to jump through. So the possibility of a bridge replacement, we're told, is likely several years away. In Washington Crossing, Ryan Hughes, CBS News, Philadelphia. 
Well, traffic deaths are now trending downward after a post pandemic spike. A preliminary analysis by the National Safety Council shows motor vehicle fatalities were down in at least 10 states. That includes New Jersey and Delaware. Both saw double digit drops, but Pennsylvania saw a 4% increase in deadly crashes. Nationwide data from the NSC shows more than 44,000 people died in traffic crashes in 2023. While that number may be alarming, it's actually a 4% drop from two years ago, but still 13% higher than before the pandemic. The NSC says speeding, distracted driving and impaired driving are major factors. At the beginning of the pandemic, we had less people driving. Um, I think um, that provided some drivers the visual cue or per perhaps the permission to drive faster. Um, and unfortunately, that type of behavior has not subsided since um, traffic returned to our roadways. Um, so unfortunately, that's uh, sort of a, the outcomes that we're seeing on the roadways. The agency says nearly half of all roadway fatalities occur on rural roads. New Jersey State Police are adding license plate readers to the Delaware River Port Authority bridges in an effort to help fight crime. These cameras will be installed on the Ben Franklin, Walt Whitman, Betsy Ross and Commodore Barry bridges. Officials say the new cameras are intended to help law enforcement track cars connected to suspected crimes. Last month, DRPA board members voted to allow the installation under a 10 year agreement. To calm people's fears about that big brother perspective, it's certainly not that. Um, but people that have committed major, you know, felonies, murders, things of that nature, kidnappings, those are the types of um, things where these LPRs will be useful and be utilized for investigative purposes. The cameras will be operated and maintained by New Jersey State Police. Installation is expected to take place by late spring or early summer. Well, this popular playground in West Deptford is going to be taken down after it was deemed unsafe. The Field of Dreams playground was built back in 1996. It's been closed since June when engineers first noticed some safety concerns. Now they say the wooden structures can't be fixed, so they have to tear it down. Township has yet to say what will replace the playground on that property. The South Jersey School District is easing its crackdown on computer time after school. Last week, the Deptford Township School District announced its plan to lock students out of their school issued laptops at night because the district says some students were using their computers well after midnight. Well, now they've made adjustments to help students get their work done on time. For elementary school students, computers will shut down from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Middle school students won't be able to access their computers between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. High schoolers have until 1130 every night to finish any work on their laptops. The updated times give students an additional hour on their computers. One South of Jersey fifth grader is helping those in need in her community. Lily Ciutitia recently visited Cooper University Hospital and donated more than 600 backpacks to those facing homelessness. Each backpack was filled with blankets and personal care items. This is not Lily's first time giving back to the hospital in 2020. She donated more than 1000 socks to patients in need. And since 2022, she has donated more than 800 backpacks to Cooper. Automated external defibrillators were delivered to Egg Harbor Township Veterans Park. It's an effort by the Atlantic Care Heroes Foundation to provide resources for cardiac emergencies. Since 2002, the program has placed more than 400 AEDs in South Jersey. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of the Jersey Pulse after this break. Welcome back. The Jersey Pulse continues. New Jersey's Governor Phil Murphy delivering his state of the budget address in Trenton. The $56 billion spending plan includes a new 2.5% tax on businesses to fund New Jersey Transit. Today, we are proposing a corporate transit fee. It will provide a dedicated funding stream for NJ Transit at no additional cost to our working families. With this fee, we're going to ask the biggest corporations with net incomes greater than $10 million to support NJ Transit's future. Well, the budget also includes $2.7 billion for the Anchor Property Tax Relief Program a record $11.6 billion for schools and a full pension payment of $7.1 billion. Funding for community colleges in New Jersey could be on the chopping block. Governor Murphy's proposed budget would cut out $20 million in funding for those colleges. The 18 community colleges in New Jersey serve about 230,000 students. 
Last year, the state increased funding for community college by $20 million. School leaders say that was the first increase in 10 to 15 years. But according to the governor's proposed budget, it was a one time thing. At a time when we believe that we need to invest in community colleges, um, we're now seeing a really disturbing reduction in the governor's proposed budget. What we don't want to do is add cost to student tuition because students can't afford it. Well, Hudson County College President Chris Reber says the reduction could mean programming cuts and tuition hikes. Well, for the first time, students at a Burlington County College will be able to major in beer. South Jersey reporter Brandon Golder explains how the new partnership will create the Garden State's first associate degree in brewing. Before Bob Hochgirdle became co-owner of Kings Road Brewing Company, he was a college professor. Quit that cold turkey to open the first brewery in Haddonfield. I kind of feel like once you're a teacher, you're always a teacher. Now he'll help tap the next generation of brewers, as Kings Road is partnering with Rowan College of Burlington County to launch New Jersey's first associate degree in brewing beer. There's an art to brewing beer, but there's also a science to brewing beer, and, and that's the formal education that's part of this. Part of the education will be in the classroom, but also hands-on experience in a brand new microbrewery. The microbrewery will be located here in what was the community house of Morristown's pool that was built in the 1920s. Following more than a million dollars in renovations, brewing operations, such as the large metal tanks, will be located in the pool, surrounded by a tap room and seating. We want to keep as much of the pool tiles and surfaces that actually exist here. We've even talked about having some beers, adult swim, IPA, and, and you know, no diving dunkel. Rowan College at Burlington County President Dr. Michael C.O.C. says their curriculum will include science, business, and marketing classes to give students a hop up in the craft beer industry. We would not be entering into uh, uh, the launch of a major that didn't have guaranteed employment on the backside, and we think that the timing of this makes a lot of sense. The timing for when students can take their first brewing classes, the fall of 2025. Brandon Goldner, CBS News, Philadelphia. 18 shore towns in Jersey will share $100 million to maintain or expand their boardwalks. The state is giving the town $4.8 million uh, from the Boardwalk Preservation Fund. Atlantic City is getting $20 million. COVID-19 recovery funds under the American Rescue Act allowed New Jersey to create this boardwalk preservation program. Governor Phil Murphy says the investment will help the towns remain vibrant tourism destinations. Well, the holiday season is long over, but the spirit is alive and well in one Jersey Shore town, at least when it comes to Christmas trees. This February night, CBS News Philadelphia's Nikki Dementry takes us to Atlanta County to share how the pines are meeting the dunes. Christmas trees in February. It's not a topic typically talked about this time of year, except if you're in Brigantine. With a bed full of spruce, fir, and pine trees, the city's public works department is heading to the beach to continue a late holiday tradition. Yes, in Brigantine, it's become a tradition, you could say yes. Public Works Superintendent John Doring is talking about the city's recycled Christmas tree program. Instead of putting beach fence down the middle here, we use the Christmas trees to help catch the sand and build the dunes. Truckload by truckload. The team of two braved the cold and brought the dried out trees into this gully like spot in the dune. This started with the New Jersey Beach Buggy Association back in the uh, mid 70s. Doring says the city picked it up not long after and have asked people to donate their trees, minus the lights and ornaments, of course, for the last 30 years. This is the row of trees that we did last year. It runs probably four or five blocks to the south. Each year, Public Works picks a spot in need and gets to work. It works. And that's why we do it every year. Try to help protect the homes. The homes are right there. This year, some 1,500 to 2,000 trees were collected. Public Works says it'll take them about two weeks to lay out all the trees across multiple beach blocks, starting right here at 22nd Street. 
The plan is to keep the tradition going for years to come. That is until when we run out of trees. With this response, it doesn't look like that'll be happening anytime soon. Nikki Dementry, CBS News, Philadelphia. Mohegan Tribe will end its management of Resorts Casino in Atlantic City at the end of this year. Mohegan owns 10% of Resorts Casino and was brought in to run things back in 2012. The casino earns $163 million last year alone, but now the casino says it's ready to manage itself. At the battleship New Jersey on the Camden Water Frontier, the ship is now closed for tours as it prepares for dry dock painting and maintenance for the first time in more than 30 years. The most decorated battleship in U.S. history will make its way from Camden, pulled by four tugboats down the Delaware River to the Navy Yard in South Philly on March 21st. The ship's mast and radar have already been removed so the ship can fit under the Walt Whitman Bridge. Well, a world of underwater enchantment has returned for a limited time at Camden's Adventure Aquarium. From now until March 17th on Thursday through Sunday, you can watch shimmering mermaids swim among the fish, stingrays, and the sharks. And you can even meet some of them on land for photographs. Reservations are strongly encouraged here to catch a glimpse before they disappear. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of the Jersey Pulse after this break. Welcome back. The Jersey Pulse continues. A South Jersey seventh grader. Here it was sinking a buzzer beater. Nothing but net beyond half court, sending her team to the championship. South Jersey reporter Brandon Goldner spoke with the middle schooler about how she put trust in the process. For Sarah Gavayan, she loves basketball because it's a team sport. I think just being with my teammates, and being able to play with them in a sport. But it's her individual performance that's lifting her team to a potential championship. <laughs> Sarah's team, the Haddonfield Bulldogs, was playing in the final four of the seventh and eighth grade division of the ICBL Girls Basketball League in South Jersey. They were down late in the game until her teammate and friend, Quinn Langle, made this three point shot to send the game into overtime. <laughs> Then in overtime, with the score tied 37-37 and less than five seconds left on the clock. My friend was right here guarding the best girl on the team. And she like, she, uh, she poked it to me. I grabbed it, I kind of lost control of it, but I kept it. I picked it up here, thinking I couldn't shoot it. The girl knocked it out of my hands. I was driving and I just chucked it up and shot it. It went in with a swish. I was just happy and surprised and grateful that it went in. I knew it was going to be a really big day. Sarah's former teacher, Maya Argano, recorded the game-winning shot on her phone. I actually had tears in my eyes, but that's not, like, far off for me. Um, I was super, super proud. I knew that that was, like, a once-in-a-lifetime moment. A moment Sarah says she will cherish not for the individual glory, but because of what her team accomplished. Our team pushed hard and worked back on defense to be able to get the ball and shoot it. As we honor Black History Month, a new museum honoring pioneering black baseball players is about to open in New Jersey. And CBS News correspondent Bradley Blackburn takes us to Patterson, New Jersey for a look. In Patterson, New Jersey, next to the Great Falls of the Passaic River, historic Hinchliffe Stadium is ready for roaring crowds once again. We brought the stadium back. Now it's time to tell the story. This Depression-era field was once home to teams in the Negro Leagues, back when baseball was segregated and some of the best players in the game, like Patterson's own Larry Doby, were excluded from white teams. You could come here and just see stars, you know, Monty Irvin, Ray Dandridge, to Larry Doby, just stars. They all played on this field, 20 Hall of Famers, played at Hinchliffe Stadium. Hinchliffe is one of the few Negro Leagues ballparks still standing, but it fell into disrepair in the 90s. After a multi-million dollar restoration, the field is again hosting games. A minor league team is based here, and a new museum is now under construction, connected to the stands. Negro League Baseball is a very important part of history. It's a discussion around Jim Crow, segregation, but also about athletes and society and, and black people persevering. Montclair State University is helping curate and develop the Charles J. Muth Museum of Hinchliffe Stadium. 
This was a critical part in the civil rights movement. University President Jonathan Coppell says it's a story everyone should know, including those coming to see a game. We want it to be an active, engaged learning environment where young people and community members are coming in and learning the history of this stadium and what it means to Patterson. A new home base for history on the field where it happened. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News, Patterson, New Jersey. Ricardo the Bull, you might remember he was spotted running down the railroad tracks near Newark Penn Station in December. Well, his popularity earned Ricardo a big check from New Jersey Transit. A $10,000 check was presented to Ricardo's new home, Skylands Animal Sanctuary and Rescue in Sussex County. New Jersey Transit raised the money by selling Ricardo plush dolls, which by the way, are now sold out. A lot of special birthdays were being celebrated on Leap Day Thursday. Virtual Voorhees Hospital held a party to welcome their little Leapsters, and there were a lot of them. Here's CBS News Philadelphia health reporter Stephanie Stahl. It only happens every four years, and this Leap Day at Virtual Hospital in Voorhees was busy. This is Amayas Parker, and that is Eris Parker. The Parker twins among a big batch of Leap Day babies. We're happy that they're here. That's the most important part. It's unusual, but they're here. Babies born on February 29th are called leaplings, and there were plenty of celebratory toy frogs leaping for joy in recognition of the newborns. We were hoping for it because we thought it'd be fun for him. Andrea and Mike Bryan also welcomed a leap baby, Russell, who was a week early. He is eight pounds, 14 ounces, and he was 21 inches. So he's pretty big. He's, yeah, pretty, he's big. pretty big for an early baby. The Bryans say he's their third baby born just before 4 a.m. I don't think we realized it was even uh, like a leap year until yeah. yesterday. Yeah, that's true. So <laughs> it didn't really dawn on us, I think, until like we were in the middle of the labor process. Yeah. The Parker twins were born right after Russell. Dad Anthony is a twin with a big family at home waiting to greet the new babies. We got two more to add to the bunch that we already have. We have five. So these, this makes six and seven. Happy birthday, doctor. Happy birthday. Also celebrating a Leap Day birthday, Virtua OBGYN Eric Grossman. Uh, today I'm 13. My youngest of four kids is 13 years old, so I get to be the same age as my youngest kid. Um, and that's the last time. After this, all my kids will be older than me. He's actually 52 and happy to be working on his birthday. I think uh, February 29th is a unique day. So uh, if I can be at work and deliver a baby or two, that's a good day for me. By dinner time, Virtua Voorhees had delivered 17 Leap Day babies. I'm Stephanie Stahl, CBS News, Philadelphia. And Sopranos fans, now is your chance to own the centerpiece from one of the most talked about scenes in television history. You'll know this if you were a fan. The booth from the last scene in the Sopranos finale, it is being auctioned off on eBay. It's where Tony Soprano and his family sat as the screen cut to black, ending the hit series in quite the mystery. The, bo the booth, that is, is from Holston's in Bloomfield, New Jersey, and the restaurant is renovating. Bids for the auction are up to more than $63,000 already. The constant wear and tear, especially since The Sopranos is just, um, they've all been weakened and beaten down, and you know, they're just, can't be salvaged. I'm definitely gonna be sad. It was one of my favorite shows, so for me to have the final scene shot here was, uh, was very just satisfying. That is an iconic booth there. The auction is set to end this Monday. Thank you for joining us for this week's Jersey Pulse. Be sure to stay with CBS News Philadelphia every week for more stories impacting the heart of your community. Don't go anywhere. We have more news coming up.